Hey everyone, welcome to lesson four of theme eight, GCSE Geography. We're going to be looking at tourism and its impact on water supplies and coastlines today. And to do that, we're going to use the northeastern area of Australia near the Barrier Reef as a case study um, around a city called Cairns. So if you pause the video here a moment, write down today's title so we can get started. Okay, so the first thing I'd like you to do Let's just take a look at this image and see if underneath your title in your book, you can come up with five questions that you would want to ask about this picture. So I've put a question grid on the side. Basically, the further down or across the grid you go, the more complex the question you could generate from that box would be. So it's absolutely fine. Think of some five W questions, um, but try to use some more sort of predictive question stems as well. So any five questions you can come up with, I'm basically just trying to really get you to think more deeply about this image. Okay, so some of you have probably written down, where is it? How many people are on this boat? What is this boat for? Is it a cruise ship? What kind of trees are these? Why do they need sea defences? But what about perhaps why has this area been developed? What impact has this development had on the environment? Will it bring more benefits than negatives? Might it have destroyed habitats that were originally here when all of this was built? And that's sort of what today's lesson is about, really. Obviously, we looked in a previous theme at the rise of global tourism. We go on more long haul holidays than ever before. You can actually fly direct all the way to the west coast of Australia now. Um, and obviously that global tourism is going to have an impact on cultures and environments around the world because we're flying more, we're sailing more and tourists like nice hotels, lots of facilities, high-end food and drink and cafes and restaurants and things like that and we're going to focus today on how those demands affect water supply and ecosystems in tourist areas as well as the people that originally lived there so why do tourist areas use so much water we've got some picture clues here so what i'd like you to do is for a moment pause this video and either write a subheading with bullet points or put this little sentence as a spider diagram. You won't need more than half a page and try and come up with five reasons why tourist areas use so much more water than a normal residential area. OK, so the sorts of things that I included using those images. You're washing your linen. Well, the hotels would be washing your linen. Linen is the word for all of the bedding and towels and things like that and your sheets and duvet covers and so on. Now, sometimes when you go and stay in hotels now, pre-COVID, obviously, um, you have an option to hang a little thing on your door to say, I don't want my linen changed today because the usual practice is to change the bed linen and the towels every single day. And that means they're getting washed every single day. And whilst, yes, sometimes the bed linen is made of pure cotton, quite often there's polyester and all sorts in these linens. And you then end up with microplastics getting washed into the into the waterways. So you're talking about little fibers of plastic coming out of polyester clothes and linens ending up in rivers and waterways. And of course, all the chemicals that are used to actually clean the linen that then washes out of all the industrial washing machines into the local waterways. And especially if we're talking about tourism in LICs, there's not really any rules and regulations on um, keeping that under control. Facilities like spas, swimming pools, hot tubs, etc. Obviously, a lot of high end hotels now have spa facilities in them and leisure facilities and swimming pools. The food that's used in the restaurants and cafes, either on site in the hotels or in the tourist areas. Remember, we talked about embedded water before the water it takes to produce a kilogram of beef, the water it takes to produce the tomatoes you want to eat, the strawberries you want to eat, never mind then actually the washing and preparation process, washing of all the cutlery and the crockery in industrial sized um, dishwashers. Um, so you're going to get an awful lot of water waste from there. 
in the rooms themselves baths showers flushing toilets taps in a couple of square kilometers you could have hundreds even thousands of rooms if you've got a few hotels multi-story hotels there with families and couples staying in them and that's going to mean an awful lot of water being used i think the figure is something like per how many liters of water is used when you flush the toilet hold on let me google liters of water to flush toilet <laughs> So on average, three to four litres every time you flush the toilet. So that's an awful lot of water being wasted. Um, and this water usually is coming from groundwater supplies that local villages are relying on to grow their crops, rear their animals, to drink and wash for themselves. And finally, leisure facilities. So any golf courses need watering, filling and cleaning and changing the water in the swimming pools, watering the grounds. It's nice to have lots of palm trees and flower beds and things like that well you need water to maintain all of that so these are just some of the top reasons why tourist areas use so much more water than usual residential or commercial areas now like i said all that water is being taken from the groundwater supplies it's not going to be available for local people for um for the wildlife in the local habitats and looking at the impact of tourism on habitats in coastal areas if we're looking at cairns in australia so if i actually just end the show here a second and go into i haven't got it open already i should have prepped this hold on Middle earth so australia is part of the continent oceania um, along with New Zealand and Fiji in those kind of countries it's an island nation um, come on Google Earth the area we're going to focus on is in the northeastern corner now um, around 70% of Australia is what they call arid um, it's mostly desert especially in the center they call it the red center it gets very very dry and very very hot and it's quite drought stricken you can see the color of it in fact so a lot of the centre is really drought stricken. If we zoom in a little bit further, though, you can see along this northern corner here, it's actually really quite green. There is some rainforest up here on this northern tip. And this dark blue area you can see here, this is the Great Barrier Reef. Very famous. You've most likely heard about it. All right. And towards this northern tip here is a town called Cairns. Very, very popular holiday destination. It's absolutely beautiful, in fact. Let me show you. Cairns, Australia. Very high end, lots of money and high income people living there. You can go on rainforest, treetop walks, there's beautiful beaches, loads of diving day trips, weekend trips. Super, super beautiful and really high end cafes and shopping and so on and so forth. OK, so we come back to this. The problem is before Cairns was there, so if you think about the image in, at the very start, these areas where boats come into dock to, for tourists to get off and visit cities like Cairns, before the tourism industry was there and before the cities like Cairns were built, they would have been natural habitats. And one of the most common natural habitats in tropical coastal regions like northeastern Australia that I was just telling you about has a bit of rainforest there is a mangrove ecosystem. Now, mangroves are really, really special because they are a tidal ecosystem. They can survive at really low water and really high water. They've got very special root systems. And these root systems are often a nursery for loads, hundreds, thousands of different species of wildlife. And the mangroves also do humans a favour. They are a natural flood and coastal erosion defence. They break up the wave energy as the tide is coming in and out, and they break up any storm energy if there's waves during an intense storm. So they are a natural coastal erosion and flood defence. They do us a favour. As I mentioned, it's also a very complex ecosystem, home to not only terrestrial, land species like howler monkeys and many nesting birds but also a lot of marine wildlife as well so sea or river wildlife the root structures traps fine nutrient-rich sediment and what that does is it's 
its own self-fulfilling fertilizing system. It traps, as the rich sediment is being eroded down from the land and washed out to sea, it traps it as it's coming down the rivers and out into the ocean. And it keeps its own super fertile mud system there to support the ecosystem growing and living there. Finally, it's also like a swampy wetland area. So it's super safe as a breeding ground for lots of fish, crocodile, snakes and crabs. So from a wildlife point of view, it's a very complex natural ecosystem that is delicately balanced, as all ecosystems are. And from a human point of view, it does us a favour. Anyone living inland behind these mangroves, you're not going to have to spend money on sea- on coastal defences, which can be millions of dollars every year. You're not going to have to worry too much about flooding and coastal erosion during storms or anything like that. Your homes are going to be naturally protected by these mangroves. Now, you do have this photo in the handout that goes with this lesson, but if you don't have a printer, don't stress about it. You could do this as a subheading with four bullet points. So tourism and the coastline, Cairns, Australia, and do a little before subheading with four bullet points. Or you could just write before tourism as the bubble, mangrove ecosystems without the photo and make a spider diagram. If you're able to print the photo out and you want to put it in the middle of the spider diagram, just as I have, then by all means, go ahead. But for a moment, I'd like you to pause the video here and go ahead and make a short spider diagram or bullet point list about what the areas are like before tourism pops up in tropical cities like Cairns. Okay, so obviously we're now going to look at the after. And here is a prime example. This is the image from the start. Now, believe it or not, this area used to look exactly like this. Okay exactly the same. It's actually just a little bit further down the coastline from where this image was taken. This area is yet to be developed. So this is a little bit further down the eastern coastline of Australia. Um, and it's now a cruise ship dock tourist spot. Okay, so it's a spot the difference, basically. This would have been 100% natural mangrove ecosystem. Obviously, number one, ain't no mangroves there no more. <laughs> There's not a mangrove in sight. So you've lost this ecosystem that we're talking about. You've also lost the natural coastal defence. So you're now going to have to spend money on coastal defences. If you remember way back to theme one, this is riprap or rock armour. So lots of boulders being put in place here to try and break up the wave energy, which the roots of the mangroves would have done perfectly fine. And then you've got a bit of a sea wall here as well that's made of concrete. And when you make concrete, it releases carbon dioxide, which adds to climate change, which causes sea level rise, which is gonna destroy your nice little tourist spot anyway. So our human actions quite often are backfiring on ourselves in the long run, and we just don't realize it in the short run because it's all about making a profit in the short run. And that's exactly what tourism is doing here. So the mangrove forest, blah, 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 start again. The mangrove forest has been removed, so that natural coastal flood defense is lost, and you're now gonna to have to spend more money on defending the coastline from erosion because that area of Australia, as you can see, is really low lying. It's not very high above sea level at all. So you've now got to defend yourself, and that's gonna cost money and use man-made materials. The ecosystem of the coral reef as well is now going to get really damaged because you've got cruise ships coming in and out over the top of it. So the barrier reef runs just out to sea here. And you've got cruise ships coming in and out, trashing it when they drop their anchor, trashing it with the bow and the hull of the cruise ship as they come through. Um, and coral is a living ecosystem. When you break it, the, the polyps and all the little... Um, bacteria and things like that that live inside the coral it kills them and that's the basis of the food chain for the coral reef so all the all the marine wildlife then will leave as well and you get what's called coral bleaching and i'll come to that in a moment increased air pollution this runs on fossil fuels you're going to have massive levels of air pollution and as we know that means greenhouse gases and that means more climate change and more sea level rise but you're bringing hundreds of thousands an area like Cairns, you're probably talking millions of tourists per year and they're going to spend money in local businesses and the economy is going to be boosted. So from an economic point of view, there'll be benefit that will offset the cost of the flood defences you've had to put in place and it will create a lot of jobs in the area as well. So that's going to improve levels of disposable income and it's going to improve standard of living. So as with any issue where we look at humans doing something, it's it's the classic 
the environment loses out, but the economy benefits. So pause the video here a moment again. You've got this photo in the handout, but if you're not able to print it out, don't worry. Either make a subheading with bullet points or a spider diagram to highlight the impacts of changes to ecosystems in coastal areas as a result of tourism. You're welcome to color code these if you like. These two are positive and these three are negative. But pause the video here a moment and do that, please. Okay, so I'm talking about the Great Barrier Reef, and you've probably heard lots about the Great Barrier Reef, but what is a barrier reef? Okay, and how can it be managed sustainably? Why is it under threat? The barrier reef and coral reefs around the world are not only being destroyed by ships um, crashing over the top of them, anchors being dropped on top of them, tourists on diving trips snapping bits off for a souvenir on purpose or snapping bits off with their fins because they're not very skilled divers. Um, yeah, it's not just because of that. There's other threats to coral reefs as well, which we'll review in a minute. But if you go onto the PowerPoint for this lesson and copy and paste this link, our lord and saviour david attenborough will talk you through a little bit about what a barrier reef actually is how the coral is alive and why it's multicolored, and the marine wildlife that it supports so pause the video here a moment come out and watch that on youtube and then come back okay so the barrier reef it should look like this lots of multicolored corals lots of wildlife and marine life okay this is what a healthy coral reef looks like for several reasons coral reefs are being damaged and bleached and they end up looking more like this because the polyps that live within the coral coral is built up of sort of calcium carbonate and things like that the um, polyps that live within them have died for various reasons so it then doesn't have its multicolored appearance and if the polyps and the coral die then it can't support the marine wildlife that lives within it usually and that will destroy the whole food chain all the way up to the sharks and stuff that you find visiting here and manta rays and things like that they just won't be here anymore so this is what it looks like once the damage has been done and as usual this damage is irreversible it's called coral bleaching so why is the Great Barrier Reef under threat? How is it being bleached and destroyed? It's a UNESCO World Heritage Site. So it's that means that it's been highlighted as being super important for multiple reasons, not only for wildlife biodiversity, but actually for local culture as well. There are 70 Aboriginal groups um, that traditionally fish in the area and there's a lot of shipwrecks there of historical significance. So Aboriginals are the indigenous people in Australia. They were there long before any Westerners came over and started colonising the country and there's a lot of historical conflict actually of racial inequality and Aboriginals being treated very horrifically to be honest, very unfairly. Um, but part of their remaining tradition is the fishing grounds along the Barrier Reef and just like the tribes in the rainforest, the Aboriginal tribes in Australia, they only use the reef sustainably, they only take what they need. So it's a world heritage site for cultural, historical and biological, um, ecological reasons. But it's under threat from lots of things. The third bullet point here, tourism that we've been talking about, but also, as we've mentioned previously, global warming. Our planet's climate is changing. So as the atmosphere warms, the oceans in parts of our planet are warming as well. And coral survives in quite a narrow temperature range. It only takes a change in average sea temperatures of one to two degrees to kill the polyps that live in the coral. So climate change is a massive threat to the coral reef, causing coral bleaching. Overfishing, similar to what I was saying about the cruise ships and the tourist dive boats, not only is it ripping the fish from the reef, like grouper is a really good eating fish, so it's very, very popular in the restaurants and cafes along the coastline here. So overfishing of certain species will destroy the food chain, but also the fishing boats themselves, what they tend to do is drop mass massive nets, it's called a trawler, and they literally just rip that net along the seabed and of course that's going to tear the coral apart and finally we've got land-based sources of pollution now what i mean by that is human activity going on on the land when it rains say you've been it's a residential development site so you're digging up a lot of the soil 
when it rains, that loose soil gets washed into the rivers and washed out into the bays and over the coral reefs. And that murky, muddy water full of soil will block out the sunlight and then the coral reef can't photosynthesize or the plants on it can't photosynthesize. Um, another example would be fertilizers used for farming or any chemicals used by humans on land. When it rains, they get washed into the rivers. The rivers wash those chemicals out into the sea and it poisons the coral reef. So what I'd like you to do is put a subheading. Why is the barrier reef under threat? You can copy these three. and I'd like you to extend this fourth one using information from this handout. Now there is a copy of this in the handout that goes with this lesson or you can just sort of zoom in on it on this on the PowerPoint whatever you'd like but I'd say you'd easily be able to pick up three or four examples of land-based as in human action is producing it on the land and it could be tens even hundreds of kilometers away but the intricate river systems will carry that sediment or those toxins or those chemicals or those bits of rubbish and plastic, it will carry them from one small river to another small river to a bigger river and eventually out into the ocean and it will affect the coral reef. So pause the video here a moment. Subheading, why is the Great Barrier Reef under threat? Copy those first three bullet points and then extend that fourth bullet point using information that you can see on this handout, please. So the coral reefs around the world, in particular the barrier reef, not in a good way. So what can we do about it? How can we manage it sustainably? Because it's a huge tourist attraction. It brings a lot of money to the area, provides a lot of jobs. So we need to allow it to continue to boost the area economically, but in a way that doesn't cause damage to the culture of the local aboriginals or to the ecosystem of the reef itself. It's that ongoing concept of sustainability that we talk about all the time, allowing something to continue without causing damage. So apologies, this isn't the easiest thing to read. It is in the handout as well, if you wanna kind of zoom in more. I've taken a photo of it from the textbook, basically. So what you've got in this image, it is basically Rockhampton and Gladstone. If I come back into Google Earth. Okay. Rockhampton and Gladstone, I think. It's a long time since I've been Rockhampton. Australia, Queensland. Oh, uh, calm down. Okay, let's come out a little bit. Whoa, chill, chill, chill. Okay. No. Okay, I made that far harder work than it needed to be. So, <laughs> Rockhampton and Gladstone are down here on the east coast of Australia. Here's the barrier reef coming down and around here. So it's right at the southern edge of the barrier reef. Very, very popular dive sites here. What they've tried to do, if we go back and look at this, is they have tried to do sort of like an ocean zoning plan. OK, so there's the coastline. There's Rockhampton. So the barrier reef runs all the way down here and Cairns would be north of here, up there. They've made a buffer zone. OK, and in the buffer zone, only some fishing is allowed. We talked about overfishing of species like grouper and the public are allowed to enjoy the natural environment in this zone. You've got a conservation park, this yellow area here and in the conservation park. Only a limited amount of fishing is allowed. So we've got some fishing, limited fishing. So there's positives so far that they're starting to control the overfishing going on in the area. The blue area is general use. And general use, trawling is not allowed. Remember I talked about trawling where they drop a massive net and rip it along the seabed. But crabbing, boating, diving, photography, line fishing and trawling are all allowed. So trawling is not allowed. <laughs> I write to the WJC and tell them there's a typo. But basically the general use area is pretty much crack on as you were. Do whatever you like and what's a bit depressing is the biggest area of this land use zone of the ocean use zoning is still general use 
So how effective is the strategy really going to be? Habitat protection. So in the blue, in the dark blue zones, these bits, sensitive and vulnerable habitats are protected from damaging activities. So there's virtually no fishing, diving, tourism allowed in this area, which is a positive. Um, you've got a little island, but there, don't stress too much about that one. The Marine National Park. Marine National Parks behave exactly the same way as terrestrial national parks, okay? Just like Snowdonia. It is a protected area of land. So fishing and oyster collecting are not allowed. Boating, swimming, snorkeling and sailing are allowed. So you're allowed to do stuff close to the surface, but there's no fishing or messing about with the reef allowed in those areas preservation no one can enter without written permission so this is the highest level of protection which is great news however <laughs> can you spot how much of this great barrier reef management zone plan is actually this kind of medium gray preservation yep that much why bother <laughs> so that's pretty depressing the highest level of protection only applies to this tiny area. And then scientific research, this isn't too bad either. For scientific study only, members of the public are usually not allowed. So the medium gray and the orange are the highest levels of protection, but they only apply to that bit, that bit, and that bit. So congrats, Australia. It's not the best sustainability plan, but Great Barrier Reef Management Zones, to sustainably manage all the different groups of people that want to use the reef. So we've got fishermen, we've got Aboriginal tribes, we've got tourists and so on. A zoning plan has been put in place. What are your initial thoughts? Take a look at the proportion of the park that is preservation. Also look carefully at what is still allowed, even in marine national park zones. So just take a moment to digest what areas have what activities permitted within them and whether or not you think this would actually be an effective way of sustainably managing the Great Barrier Reef. Okay, I don't know what you think. Personally, my thoughts are, let's start with the positives. A management zone plan is better than nothing at all. And there are areas where you're not allowed to trawl anymore. That's going to protect the reef. There's a lot of areas where fishing is limited. So that's going to protect the food chain and it's going to protect species numbers. But what's depressing for me is clearly concerns about the economy are winning out here over concerns about the ecosystem. The highest level of protection only applies to these three tiny areas. You've still got lots of tourism and moderate levels of fishing going on in most of these areas and that's going to mean still disruption to the food chain and damage to the coral reef from dive boats and tourists. So really let's just break this down a little bit further what might the advantages and disadvantages be of the zoning system for each of these groups of people so if you're a fisherman you're allowed to fish in some areas but nowhere near the kind of range you would have been able to fish over before what does that mean for you and your income and trying to support your family Research scientists, you do have some areas that are completely protected and only for scientific research, but those areas are really tiny. What are your feelings on this? Divers and tourists, you can still pretty much dive most of the reef. What are your thoughts and feelings? How does this plan impact you? And a conservationist, to conserve means to protect or keep the same. If you're a conservationist trying to conserve and keep the ecosystem the same in this area, what are your views on, on this plan? Now, it's in the specification that you have to evaluate sustainable, man sustainable manage. Oh my god, sustainable management strategies for the barrier reef. Um, and this is, it's not the best source to try and work from. So feel free to do a little bit of googling on the internet, see if you can find any other sustainable management strategies that they're using on the Great Barrier Reef in Australia, to help you fill in a little bit more on these. The next slide, I have filled in my thoughts for you if you're getting a little bit stuck, because I think you might find this a little bit vague. To be fair in your defense. So try and think of some yourself first and then you can use the next slide to add to your thoughts if you need to. So copy and complete this into your books please. Okay so finally here's the rundown of the things that I thought about. If you're a fisherman 
it means that you're going to lose out really because fishing has been limited so it's going to cap the amount of money you can make so you've got less disposable income and it's going to mean you've got less money to support your family but fishing is still allowed in some areas so you can still make some money and really what we need to do is change the mindset of fishermen if you keep fishing at the rate that you are there's going to be nothing left and then you will have no job so fishing a lot for the short term means no fishing at all in the long term whereas if you meet somewhere in the middle now you're always going to be able to fish because you're just bringing in medium numbers of fish so there's always going to be plenty left does that make sense research scientists um you're not overly impressed because it's only really <laughs> a sample proportion obviously that should say small you know me and my typos being monitored but it does mean that in the zones that are specifically for research you can keep a really close eye on what's happening to fish populations and a close eye on biodiversity it's pretty good if you're a diver or a tourist because the majority of the reef is still open but you need to be conscious of where you drop your anchor and make sure that inexperienced tourist divers aren't crashing into the reef, grabbing onto the reef. Their fins are snapping bits off of the reef. Some people even snap bits off to take deliberately as a souvenir, would you believe? So we need training and education for divers and um, tourist dive boat operators. Conservationist, you're not overly impressed because hardly any of the reef is actually fully protected. Uh, and that's still going to mean a lot of damage going on into the future. Have a little Google. See if you can see any other sustainable management strategies for the barrier reef. If, the, if there's anything that you could add to this. Um, otherwise, that is the end of lesson four. Well done. We've only got a couple of lessons left of theme eight. Because it's an optional theme, it's much shorter. And then we will do an end of theme past paper. So any questions as usual, drop me an email. Gleasona at hopecumry.net. Otherwise, I'll see you soon for lesson five.